Oh, hi folks, welcome to this unique event with Agile 20 Festival. Um, sorry for the slight delay, um, just a few technical issues with people joining us, but um, I'm, I'm Sath Pal Singh, everybody calls me Sath, I'm, I'm your host for this session and I'm delighted to be joined by my, my co-hosts, uh, Sabrina Bruce and Shelby Wilson and, and the three of us are, are, are trustees of the festival, so very warm welcome to you. Uh, I'm just going to go through a few of the formalities before we before we get to the reason you're all here today. Um, and it is wonderful to have so many of you joining us. Um, so, yep, this is an Agile 20 event. Um, hopefully many of you joined the, the, the wonderful opening ceremony we, we had yesterday. Great to see so many of you on. It was, a, it was a wonderful occasion. Very warm, very fun. Had a great community feel to it. So it was a delightful start to proceedings. Um, we do have over 600 events in the programme worldwide, as I think many of you know. You can see that on my, my slide there, we have um, a kind of hashtag there for you all to use and the URL for uh, the website. So, so do go on the site and, and peruse the programme. There's a diverse range of, of, of events um, available for you all uh, across a very wide range of subjects. So hopefully there's something for everyone. And of course, a shout out there for our supporting orgs, just at the top of the slide there. So thank you to all of them um, for their support. Uh, and a shout out for, for, for um, Agile Alliance, as um, we have uh, Ellen Grove with us tonight as, as one, of our, one of our guests. So just moving on quickly here. Um, so yeah, just, just, just to reiterate, um, all of the events in this program, um, all of us who are involved in the festival have agreed to adhere to the community policy. So just, just, just to remind everyone, uh, you can find that on the website if you'd like to take a look at that and read that in more detail. Um, but it's very important that, that we're all aware of that and we all support that. We want everybody to have a great experience. Uh, and ultimately, we're looking for everyone to just be supportive and respectful of one another. For, of one another. Um, and if you, do, if you would like to donate, this is a free event. It's a free festival. It's all been built by volunteers around the globe. Uh, should you wish to make a donation, you can do so using this URL here. Uh, yeah, and lastly, this, this is an extension of, of, of the, the opening ceremony that we had yesterday. So, um, yeah, I think we're officially declaring the festival open as of yesterday. And, yeah, very much looking forward to sharing the experience with you all over the, the coming weeks. So I think that's, that's the formalities. I'm going to stop that share now. So we're all gathered here today um, to share an experience with our festival patrons. And it gives me great honour to, to, to be doing this today. I'm, I'm, I feel great privilege to have this opportunity. Um, our patrons have been a tremendous uh, supporters, encouragers and advisors of, of, of what we've been trying to do in this festival. Uh, and of course, they are our patrons because they've all made incredible contributions to Agile over the last last 20 years uh, and you know we, we look to them and we seek their guidance and many of you have have their have their books in, in your homes I'm sure uh, and tonight is a great opportunity to, to have them all together on one session and learn a little bit more about them get to meet them and you all have the opportunity in the second half of the session to pose some questions so in the first half of the session I'm going to ask them all just to introduce themselves um, and hopefully we can get through that in about 30 minutes or so. We don't know, but, but that's okay. Uh, Johanna's, Johanna's looking at me going, oh, that's ambitious, Sath, that's ambitious. Um, and then, depending on how that goes time-wise, we will then take a short break, um, five minutes or so, because it is quite a long session. And then thereafter, we will give you all the opportunity to ask questions. We like to facilitate that process, because it's quite a large event. There's quite a lot of you on the session. Uh, so my co-hosts have, uh, have arranged a kind of little uh, Miro board, Miro board, however you wish to say it, and that we're going to use to just facilitate um, the conversation. So we'll share that link with you uh, in the chat. If you could then add your questions um, onto, those, on, onto that board um, against the, the different patrons and the questions you're interested in, we will then facilitate that and, and ask the questions in the second the session. We are short of time, so we're unlikely to get through all the questions, but it would be great to get through as many as we can and give the, the patrons an opportunity to share their thoughts with us. So that's the plan uh, for the session. 
Um, in the next bit, I'm going to ask you all, if you wouldn't mind, uh, just to switch off your cameras so we can just focus in on the, the patrons a little bit, um, just so that I can give it a little bit more of a panel feel. I think that's be something be good, good for us to do, if you wouldn't mind. And then I'm going to ask them all to, to say a few words, um, just, to, just to get us started. So yeah, if you could just all switch off your cameras, that would be that would be wonderful. I think I think we're okay. Great, right? Let, let, let's 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 crack on, shall we? Um, so just to start, I think if all of our patrons could just say who they are, I think most folk know who you all are, um, and then either say in a word what agile means to them, or a short succinct statement on what reaching this 20th anniversary mark means to them. Um, and perhaps if they don't mind, perhaps share a fun fact about themselves. I think that, that, that would be nice. So Alistair isn't able to, to join us for the first for the first half. So I'm gonna, I mean, neither is April actually. So I'm gonna start with Ari, um, I believe has is, is, is managed to join us. Ari had a few technical problems. Ari, are you, are you on, is Ari on? Hi, Ari. I think you're on mute. You're on mute. I'm sorry. It's all right. Yeah. Welcome. I, I'm here now. Are you, you just want to just want, yeah, I can hear you. Do you just want to just quickly introduce yourself and perhaps sure. say in a word what Agile means to you, or perhaps might be pertinent for you, what reaching this 20th anniversary mark means? Yeah, so uh, my name is Ari van Bennekum. Uh, as one of the authors of the Agile Manifesto in it for a long time. Started working in a different way in 1994 for delivering better value earlier to the client. I wanted to avoid delay. That was my, 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 my thing in Agile, avoiding delay. So the, the right stuff and as fast as you can with a good quality uh, so you don't have all the bugs and the misunderstandings and the fixes. 20 years shows us we still have a long way to go, but it's so young, right? So we have a long way to go. Fantastic. Next. Thank you for that opening. Uh, we'll move to Asa. Asa, welcome. Do you like to quickly introduce yourself? Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Asa Turazbaev. I'm from Russia. I'm pretty much a usual, I believe, agile coach. I work for a company called Scrum Tech, which I founded, that does a pretty much standard job of agile transformation for companies in Russia mostly. So this is what I do. Agile for me is different every time I work with different companies. So for example, today Agile for me is empowering teams because of this I have this kind of problem with one of with my uh, one of my customers. So helping teams to achieve more with safety, feedback, and trust. This is what is Agile for me right now. I think that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. Would you like would you like to go next, please? There we go. Hi, uh, I'm Ellen Grove, and I am the managing director of the Agile Alliance. Uh, what Agile means to me is it's really about building community. This is what's at the heart of it for me personally. It's about how do we take a people-centered approach to solving complex problems? How do we focus on the people we're solving the problems for? But also, how do we focus on the relationships and the connections between the people who are working together to, to build whatever it is we're building? And, um, you know, what's really exciting to me about the 20th anniversary is look at the way that the Agile community has grown over the past 20 years. Look at how many people from how many different parts of the world we have here today who are interested in learning together and sharing their experiences and figure out where we're going next. And I think that's really exciting. Fantastic. Love that. Thank you for that. Esther, would you like, would you like to follow on from there? I can't, I can't see Esther on my screen. Is Esther there? Est it is on mute. Esther, you're on mute. Ah, oh, Esther, you're on mute. I was on mute and my cursor was lost somewhere. <laughs> but it has been found. Um, so I'm Esther Derby and I, um, I wrote a little book on retrospectives, so 
that found its way into the community. Um, what Agile means to me is making software more humane while at the same time adding more value. And I think the humanity part or the humaneness part is the thing that matters most to me. Um, two things about this being the 20th anniversary is that there are potentially people who have a significant career in software who now have only known this way of working. That when they started, they were exposed to Agile and that's been what they've done their entire career. Um, and it continues to surprise me that people take a very non-agile approach to becoming agile. I would like people to change to agile in an agile manner. And the fun fact is that I have a loaf of sourdough that's ready to come out of the oven. So I'm going to go get it now and then I'll be back. Fantastic. Love it. Perfect Love it. timing. Perfect timing, yep. Um, Gabriel, you're, you're next. Welcome. Hey there. So uh, I thought it was really interesting, the timing that we're talking about, what the last 20 years have been about, considering what's going on, because the people I've seen surviving this and doing really well are super agile. They're very adaptive. And I keep thinking we've all trained for this. And one of my favorite inspirations during this time has been Ricardo, who's actually on the call from, he's got an agile restaurant in London. I mean, these guys were told, close your doors. He had five hours to pivot to a completely new business model. Why people are in the restaurant, he repurposes it on the fly. <clears throat> and we've been speaking the whole time. I've pivoted my business model multiple times during the pandemic. So all of us, I think it's, I love Ricardo's spirit. It's about, it's all a great opportunity. And it is, it, we're so lucky. We've got even more reasons to do better. So that idea of what we can do that we've trained for, I've been super adaptive and helping people solve problems. For me, that's really important at the moment. <clears throat> Fun fact, I got four citizenships and I move around the world a lot. I think people now think that I'm on the lam, that I'm a secret agent or I'm a crime lord. Are, are, are you a secret agent? What do you think? Maybe. <laughs> Wouldn't be a secret agent. Exactly. 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, Johanna. Okay, so agility, uh, not agile, because agile is an adjective, and agility is what we want. Agility to me means um, really optimizing for adaptability and resilience. And what I see now in our 20 years of reflection and, and going forward is a way, to, as Esther said, to focus on creating humane workspaces. We have, we have this opportunity now to move just from the team perspective, which is what the original Agile Manifesto talked about, to really embracing agility in our organizations and the mechanistic way of looking at the entire organization. Yeah, that doesn't do it. And I am too serious to have any fun facts at all. <laughs> I don't believe that for a second. Hey, <laughs> uh, Lisa. Welcome. I, I love that, Joanna. Mm. So I'm Lisa Atkins. Hello, everyone. Coming to you from Richmond, Virginia. And um, I'm an Agile and leadership coach. And I think about Agile and I think about our ability to, to stay sane during really complex and ever-changing times. That what we know how to do as a community, because we've been practicing in our organizations, is how to metabolize change that is constantly coming at us and continue to make forward progress even so, um, and maybe especially so. So I love that about Agile. And here at the 20th mark, I just really want us to allow ourselves, myself included, to feel the joy of celebration. Although there is a lot more to do, boy, we have come a long way, a long way. And so I'm bringing in that uh, wild abandon of celebration and not letting us off the hook of that until we've celebrated enough. And then we can go right back to continuous improvement and being hard on ourselves and all that sort of thing. 
No, fantastic. And uh, I never forgot um, the interview I, I, I did with you as part of our Meet the Patron series. And, and you talked about we're kind of often less capable of, of, of giving ourselves that kind of space and capacity to express joy. Um, that really resonated with me. And I think we're, we're keen for everybody to celebrate and express joy over, over, over the month as we, as, we, as we learn collectively. Both celebrate the past um, kind of enjoy the, the current, marvel at what's going on now, and then also kind of contemplate and explore the future. So, th- thank you for that. Peter, Peter, I'm going to have to give you a shout out because it is very early where you are. So, yeah. you, you, you have my respect, sir. So. <laughs> well, I, I hope what I'm about to say makes sense at 4 a.m. in the morning. It probably <laughs> won't. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Peter Merrill. Uh, I've been involved with Agile since before it was called Agile. I spoke at um, XP2K about six months before the um, manifesto came out and I invented the first Agile game. And these days I'm founder of the Xscale Alliance and author of the Agile DAO and a whole bunch of other silly things. Um, I see Agile as um, a massive challenge that in some ways we are failing to grasp. Uh, We've had 20 years of a revolution and uh, we have a 5% score on adaptability according to the most recent State of Agile survey. If you look at that number, the last couple of surveys said it was about responding to changing market conditions. 5% before that, it was 6% there. Anyway, Um, Business agility, to my mind, is the challenge ahead. Uh, I don't want to rattle on for too long, but we are fighting against a problem called bureaucracy. And there are ways to attack that problem that we haven't even begun to grasp properly. And a lot of the stuff we've been doing has only been feeding that problem. So I'd love to talk about that more. I've got a session on descaling in a couple of hours. Uh, on the descaling manifesto, which is specifically about that. I'll shut up. Fantastic. Thank you, Peter. Roman, welcome. Hello. <laughs> were you, ser- were you, ser- yeah, were you I'll, searching I'll for your myself. unmute mute as well, were you? Sorry, say that again, Tav? No, I was it looked like you were also searching for your mute unmute. That's right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Roman, um, and I uh, work on the intersection of Agile and product management. And so when I reflect on uh, the last 20 years, um, you know, what comes to mind is how much Agile has um, helped to change and enrich product management, product management as a discipline, uh, you know, compared to where product management was about 20 years ago. Things like early user feedback and the ability to validate products early and frequently, or you know, reduce time to market, better co- product quality, improved adaptability, better alignment, better collaboration. I mean, those those are things that we all take for granted today. Or well, I think many people within the product management community take for granted today. But you know, as we know it today, you know, those things, those benefits didn't exist 20 years ago. So I think Agile has had a, a tremendous uh, positive impact on product management. Um, you mean, just like many, many uh, of my um, co-patrons have said, the number of challenges that still persist, but, you know, things like empowerment, for instance, you know, product owner was called product owner to emphasize the fact that the person should own the product on behalf of the company needs the right level of empowerment and respect and many product people, no matter if they're called product owners or not, are not sufficiently empowered just to mention one of the, the, the challenges that still persist, but as Lisa said, I think you know it's kind of nice to look back and look at all the achievements and the positive things, uh, without without ignoring or suppressing the, the challenges that still lie ahead. Wonderfully put. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think that gives us quite a lot to reflect on, and I'm sure there'll be many questions coming through in the second half. Where, uh, yeah, I think our attendees will be quite keen to to explore some more of these topics. Um, Sally. Can't see Sally. Oh, there's Sally. I am right here. Hey, everyone. Hello, and uh, let's celebrate together, like my friend Lisa said. Uh, so, how? So, first of all, I am the founder of Agility Health, and what I've been focusing on 
is how do we leverage measurement and continuous improvement as a way of accelerating the journey? I think a lot of companies are behind. I think they've been taking their sweet time and now they have to accelerate. They got to do this at scale. They got to do it faster, but they have to do it in a real way, regardless of the flavor of agile that you're falling in love with or the methodology. Um, I'm passionate about them measuring where they are today and actually investing and listening to the voice of the people and helping their teams grow. Um, what I feel about today is really the celebration. I mean, I think we've been through so much with 2020 and COVID and pausing to actually reflect and see where we've come, how we've matured, how Agile has impacted leadership styles, cultures. Um, I've brought Agile to Sudan, my home country. And in Sudan, no one knows that Agile was built for software or for IT. They've learned it from the start that it's just a way for teams to work and deliver work. So that whole point of this is not for software, this can apply outside, we don't even have that conversation because it was never introduced that way because that country was just so behind. And so that concept of agility and agile and, and government agility and national agility, not just business agility, excites me. So I'm very honored to be here with all of you. Um, and then so my last interesting thing is um, my leadership motto is be bold, be real and lead with love. And I have this vision of bringing love back to the workplace where we can just talk about it and feel it and communicate with it. So. Honored to be with all of you here. So lovely. No, I appreciate that. And thank you for being here. And last but not least, Mr. Simon Wardley. Hi, Simon. Hello. Uh, can I just go ditto? Because that was a brilliant uh, introduction by, by Sally. I thought that was fantastic. Um, and I, I think there is a real big difference between agile and agility. So um, I'm a mapper. Uh, what I love are maps. Uh, and to give you my background on Agile, I started with Agile back in 2000, so 21 years ago. Extreme programming, sorry, I should say. It's a big call out to, to Kent Beck. Um, that, that was fantastic. Um, what does Agile mean to me? It's a context-specific method which has evolved. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I think it's um, losing sight of its context. So uh, I, I'm going to often take the position of to go to the future, we have to go back to the past and uh, I'm sure we can get into that. So fun fact, I started my career off chauffeur punting on the River Cam, set up a group doing this back in the 1990s. And chauffeur punting, if you don't know, is the process by which you steer a boat, uh, which steers like a brick uh, through a river, which is totally cha chaotic uh, with people, lots of people uh, on boats, not knowing how to control them smashing them into you left, right and centre and you have to get yourself through this uh, to, a, to a destination at the end, which is pretty much what I do with corporations these days because it's almost identical. So thank you. Fantastic. Brilliant. That was great fun. No, thank you all for doing that. Um, that. That was lovely and good to hear from you and I'm sure the attendees enjoyed that. So we're going to we're going to um, start with some questions and from what I understand from my, my wonderful co-host the uh, the Miro board the Miro board however you choose to say it is, is, is uh, has been very busy so I think we've got quite a lot of things coming through Sabrina Shelby yeah yeah do you want do we, what we could do is what why, why don't we start with some questions and then we can take a break I'm just conscious it's quite a long session um yeah. And then we'll see. Do you want to? Do you want to start us off, one of you, with a question for one of our, one of our patrons? Why don't we just? Why don't we just get stuck into it? Yeah. So we've got one here. So I'll do one, and Shelby, Shelby can do one. So we've got one Sounds here. Great. Um, if you had one wish for um, Agile in twenty twenty two, what would it be? And that's for Alistair. Al Alistair, Alistair isn't joining us till. Um, oh, yeah, he's not yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Alistair's not here yet. No, no, no. Second one. Uh, we are now, uh, we are new to say, what's some advice that you'd give to the organization? I'm in it. Wrong one. That's for Alistair. Sorry. User error. Let's. I want to see the answer to that Sabrina. one. Sabrina. Sabrina, they're not for Alistair. I think that a lot of the people don't realize we have names across the top. I think um, that those are general questions for all of us. Well, I will so. say it and you can answer it. Um, so we are not, we are new to say, what's some advice that you give to an organization starting to implement this? 
And I'll have a go. Go for it. All right. So uh, there's nothing wrong with say. It's not a complete way of going at producing an agile organization, but there's a lot wrong with the way that it's sold. Don't let people run a push transformation in your organization. You want to do a pull transformation. You want a proof of concept that's small and works end to end business design, delivery, DevOps, and then grow it. If you try to push it into your organization, you'll wind up with a massive compromise. It doesn't matter if it's safe or scrum or DevOps or you name it, it pushes your enemy when it comes to starting this stuff. Thank you, that's a really good description. Uh, so we've got one here for Roman. So what is the industry slash area that needs agile most nowadays? All of them. <laughs> we had this conversation once before, didn't we? Any particular ones? Any that come to mind? You know, I think one of the great things about agile practices is that they've, you know, that they're so widespread these days, but, you know, at the same time, and, and I think, again, that was mentioned as part of the, the introduction, I think we all know that not all organizations are able to apply agile practices effectively. Um, so organizations that would benefit maybe from even more agility or an even more effective way of applying agile practices, government organizations, I, I would say, and also large organizations like um, like banks and insurance companies. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with some of the, the high street banks here in the UK and their processes still tend to be, um, well, <laughs> rather long-winded, you know, so. But I'm, I'm sure that you know there are other other industries that that will benefit from more agile or better agile practices, better more agility, too. So, thank you, Roman. Uh, we've got one here for Simon. So, if you could leave only one thing um, from agile, what would it be? If you could leave mm -hmm. one thing, um, the desire for agile. Um, fits everything is the uh, is the one thing that I, I, I would leave. Uh, if I look at some of the methods uh, like extreme programming, they are ideally suited for environments where change is the norm. And, and um, whereas other methods and other techniques are actually suited uh, for environments where change is not a desirable thing, where you want to do is what you want to do is reduce deviation. And in past history, what we tend to do is take any method which is suited to a specific context and try to make it into the one size fits all method, rather than realizing that whenever you deal with any complicated and complex system, that you need to apply multiple approaches depending upon how evolved the components are. Sorry, that's a CO2 monitor kicking off, apologies for that. Um, Oh, I monitor uh, air and other bits and pieces of my office. So um, uh, that's the one thing I would leave, the desire to try to make it one size fits all um, and really to focus in on the context where it is most suited. Love it. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass over to my other assistant, Shelby. Hello, everyone. Um, this is a question uh, for Joanna. Joanna, um, there's been a question put on the board that says, what would you do differently today if you could? Yeah, It'll mute, yeah, Joy. yeah. I, I was muted. I'm now fine. Yeah. Um, you might or might not know I've written several books about management. And if I if I could have done something different 20 years ago, that would have been a focus on management collaboration instead of working at the team level. Working at the team level is necessary. However, I have seen that um, the team goals don't actually get to a common person until they get to the very top of the organization. And that changes what teams can and cannot do, right? Well-meaning people can try, but they cannot succeed. So if I had known then what I know now, I would have 
started to focus on management managers a lot, a lot earlier. Of course, Esther and I wrote that nice little book, Behind Closed Doors, Secrets of Great Management, which um, many of you have found useful because you've told us. However, um, that was not quite enough. Wow, what a great, great uh, response. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, there's one here for, for um, Peter, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, what is, the heck is the Agile te Teo? Dell. Okay, uh, well, in a nutshell, Agile is not 20 years old. It's over 2000 years old. It began with a bloke named Lao Tzu, except Lao Tzu never existed. That's how agile he was. Um, and there's a whole bunch of really useful uh, mindset uh, advice in uh, Lao Tzu that uh, I've spent 30 odd years uh, trying to put into an agile frame. So it's a beta book um, uh, that's really about agile mindset. And so that's probably the right answer. Very, very much. Um, Sally, um, question here for you. We have a few teams who have adopted um, agility, but most leaders are resistance to, resisting to release people into scrum teams. Any ideas on how we can scale up, please? You know, I just, I think the time for Agile being a bottom-up movement is gone, and I think it needs to be both. It needs to be bottom-up on top-down, and I think that... Um, the, the transformation, the strategy, the leadership by example needs to come from the executive team. So we've been focused on, because honestly, a manager is not gonna change what they do or release their people to the teams if nobody above them tells them that that is the new way of working. Um, and I know maybe that doesn't sound agile because it's gonna, well, you can't force people. I'm All I'm saying is if you wanna transform your organization, the people above need to explain the why, they need to explain the strategy and they need to show um, the path forward and at least encourage everybody and create reward systems for it. But if you don't change how I'm being reported, if you don't change my context and you just tell me I gotta go do this and I'm losing control. And remember like what Joanna just said and um, we have not focused on the role of the manager, you guys. I and mean, we have to be really open and honest about that. We have trained the teams and we went up to the executives and we've done some XP and DevOps and technical. Managers, we have completely pulled the rug from underneath them. We've changed their role dramatically and we have not given them that benefit of the doubt of transitioning them and showing them the new path. And we've been very judgmental towards them. So I think that there's a bigger problem here to solve and it's not just the having them change their behavior. I think there's an organizational system problem that needs to be addressed. Wow, totally agree on that one. That's an amazing response. Thank you very much. Gabrielle, this one is, 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 is for your good self. Is there something you don't like about Agile is the question? That's a good question. <laughs> um, one thing that always puzzles me is the idea that Agile is about evolving and adapting. And yet I see many Agile approaches, frameworks being really rigid and once they get set up, it's like we're not allowed to question them, not meant to evolve them. And I just find those two things completely um, hypocritical. It just creates a massive conflict. So that's one thing that I'd like to see us get better at is, uh, you know, I look at why and I suspect it's because where there's money on the table, it gets a nice label. We don't want to change that because it might challenge what we're doing. But if we can't challenge ourselves, then we shouldn't be in this game. It's like one of my favorite sayings at a company was, um, one of the guys, Chad, said, if you're not constantly in danger of getting fired, you're just not trying hard enough. And so for all of us, you know, we have to be willing to even say our models themselves need to keep adapting. If not, we're going to stagnate and be like every other, you know, framework on the market on the rubbish tip. So that's what I don't like about our job. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> and, and lots of people in the comments are also agreeing with you. Thank you very much. Ask Kat, there's a question here for, for you as well. It says, is there anything to take into account when developing agile mindsets in the Russian culture? Wow, that's really deep questions. I spent a lot of time exploring those issues. Uh, yes, probably one of the most important problems is um, theory of culture, which is on one hand is good, on the other hand, this is a, quite the challenge thing. And direct culture means that you give immediate direct feedback when talking to people. And I've been to situation when people are trying to, I mean, working with other countries, they not try, trying to talk through manager, you know, giving feedback. Russia, you people just, our people just tell the, the thing they 
think the same moment they come across the problem. And it means that, of course, provide a lot of tension inside of teams. People start struggling like uh, quite, quite fast, I would say. But uh, basically, if you kind of manage to get through all these problems, teams are get you know closer to each other. They know how to solve their problems better, quicker. And basically, from engineering point of view, it's sometimes better. So it's the problem number one. So there are many more, but basically, uh, just to, to, to be short, you know, this is number one. Completely agree. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to go straight to um, Ellen, Ellen for this one first before I get pop into to, to Esther. But Ellen, there's a um, a question here, more more of a statement, Ellen. So I'm, I don't know how you're going to um, um, answer this one, but it says, "You are truly an inspirational woman." What is your secret to all of your life achievements? Um, a lot of serendipity, I would say, a lot of chance, because I, I'll say this: this is not the career I ever envisioned myself in when I set out. Um, but I think it's how I've come to end up here is by always being curious, by always wondering about, hey, that's something new. I want to learn about that. Let me go and figure out something about that because that's an interesting problem that I'd like to learn more about. And the really important thing is not being afraid to try stuff in order to learn new things. Um, I think a lot of people feel held, held back from trying new roles, from working in new ways, because they think I have to be an expert. I have to learn everything I need to know before I can go off and work that way or try solving that problem or do that thing. And we lose a lot of great ideas. We lose a lot of enthusiasm. We lose a lot of skill and knowledge because people hold themselves back. And uh, Honestly, that has been the secret to my career journey so far, being curious, being brave, and not being afraid to try things too much. And I think some of those things are really at the heart of working in an agile way, too. It's about asking lots of questions and, and thinking, well, what would happen if we do this? Let's go find out. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Truly blown away by that response. Thank you very much. Esther, um, two kind of state, again, some statements here. Um, I don't know how you'd like to answer them, but uh, the one question is, if you, want, if you were not to be an agilist, what else would you have become in life? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, th I think, uh, I think the, the reason I became interested in, in agile was because it, of the emphasis on collaborative teams, sustainable pace, just making work more humane. Um, and that's what really matters to me. Because I think many, um, many corporations um, working there is a soul sucking experience. And if you look in the, in the, you know, the, the family tree of management, you know, the origins are about extracting maximum labor and I think that, you know, that, that is still with us. So I think, I, I think we, um, that's what appealed to me was the explicit, um, the explicit valuing of, of uh, humanity and humaneness. So I think I probably would have ended up doing some, some form of consulting around that, whether it was in the agile space or some other space. Wow. Wow. Well, I, for one, am certainly glad that you, you are still, still an agilist. <laughs> Thank you very much, Esther. Um, Roman, there's a question here for, for you that says, have you ever given up on the company during an agile transformation? Have I ever given up on a company during an agile transformation? So it's been a while, to be honest, since I last was, was involved in uh, a proper agile transformation. These days, I tend to focus more on product ownership and product management and um, you know, leave the big picture up to other people who are more knowledgeable and competent than me. But I've certainly seen companies abandon the natural transformation. And there's one, one company I've worked with um, that about, about 2006. And um, even though they did have some local success with uh, agile practices, ultimately, I don't think it was very successful for them. And then uh, I had a follow-up conversation with them a few years ago. And 
And they were on their second journey to Agile, on their second Agile transformation, saying, this time we want to get this right. So, you know, um, even if you, you find your company um, isn't successful the first time around, maybe, you know, there's an opportunity to try again in the future. Um, but I think, um, as, as some of the other um, patrons and panelists have, have said, um, I think it's important to get the, the focus right. And I think Joanna talked about a mechanistic approach earlier. Um, and I think reflecting on, on the, the values and the principles in the Agile Manifesto you know, can be really beneficial rather than saying we want to implement safe or we want to implement less or we want to implement framework X, Y, Z or model A, B, C. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> No, oh, thanks. That Roman, that that is awesome. Thank you very much. I'm just going to quickly jump into the chat and come off the Myra board. Some people can't use it, but there's a couple of questions there. Maybe we just open it up to to all of our great great patrons that we have on the on the call. So, somebody, there's two questions. One says, "How do you think Agile prepared us for the current context and the widespread culture of remote working that we currently find ourselves in?" Uh, I'll give that one a go. Thanks, Peter. Agile is not about uh, quicker, better, faster, twice the work and half the time. Agile is about the flow of learning, not the flow of work. If we can accelerate the flow of learning through organizations, then even in a VUCA world like today, we have some hope of doing good. Anybody else like to take a take a, an answer to that one? I win. Hi, Joanna. I feel, hi. I feel very strongly about reasonable remote work. And what I am seeing now is a combination of very reasonable remote work and totally unreasonable remote work. Um, I, I still know about way too many people who are supposed to have the 3 a.m. meeting with people farther over there and the 6 a.m. meeting with people who are closer and um, the 7 p.m. and the 10 p.m. meetings with people farther west. This is unsustainable. It's, if I may say, stupid, right? <laughs> that breaks all of the flow of learning and it, it makes remote work look impossible because it is, because it's not remote work. It's, it's putting together teams who are not really teams. So. I see way too much of this and way too little of thinking about what, what really makes a team, how do we flow work through a team and get valuable outcomes on the outside. And I will stop now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. That was great, great insight. I, we, I, I, all of the, all of you patrons, I really could um, have you speak all night. There is another quick question on the on the inside chat. I think that we'll we'll take that one before I hand back to our lovely host, Sat. Before we go for a quick break, but it's the last question. And again, I'm I'm, I'm going to open it up to the to all of the the patrons. It says, um, how. I long felt principle six about face-to-face -face communication has been misused in many organizations which have rules about co-location, halting the flexibility and distributed teaming that is enjoyed by, by many progressive teams. Do you think some of the principles are outdated and should there be an effort by everyone to amend it? And that's open to all of you. Can I ask a question? Are we having a face-to-face -face conversation now? <laughs> I think we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. Simon, definitely. I'm just going to jump in real quickly. I honestly, when I teach um, any agile, because I'm having to teach it to people that don't know anything about software, um, I automatically have to change. It's, you know, not software delivery. Um, we talk about value delivery, uh, you know, people in collaboration. So we've had to modify it when we talk about, you know, the principles of, um, developers. We use the word developers a lot. We now just talk about team members. So I, I do think that, you know, we've all had to evolve as we, you know, talk about agile, especially when you're talking to business people or, um, or non-technology people. And, you know, whether it's time to evolve the manifesto itself or, um, or just agile really has evolved. I think, you know, we really have grown up and it's gone to a different level of enterprise agility, business agility. I think there's government agility. There's so much more um, happening. So I don't know. I think it's a good question to ask, you know, is it time to update the manifesto itself to version 2.0? I think there's a, an effort going on related to that. So I'm curious what my other patrons here think. Well, maybe I can jump in here. 
from my from my side because I get the question so often. You know, if you if you would write the manifesto again, what would you change? Right, that question. And um, I wouldn't change a lot because, in my opinion, it's sort of a declaration of independence. You know, it's it's an inspiration, and it's still you know it serves, in my opinion, uh, what we were looking for and still a lot of organizations are looking for. So as I said in the beginning, there's a long way to go. Uh, however, um, what, I, what I blame myself for in the time, you have to imagine that we went to Snowbird. I came in from uh, the Netherlands. I had a 23 hour flight, two and a half days work, got ripped out of the room, you know, I had to go back to the airport. So I became a little bit easy on a couple of things. And there's one thing that I, if we would write it now, would not take for granted as I took it at the time. And that's that bloody word software. Because software on its own doesn't do anything. It's a combination of, of, of a software product or a solution. Uh, the people using it and the way you want to use it together, you know, that brings the value. And I would rephrase a software as it's written in the, in the, in the manifesto itself. I would rephrase it like product or, or service or that kind of thing. Um, and then it's still extremely valid. And also we wouldn't have that continuous debate about is agile outside the world of IT always also possible. I've never done it exclusively in the world of IT. Um, and this is, this is starting in 1994. So I, I think from that perspective, I think on one hand, it's very vivid, it's very alive and very applicable. Uh, and at the same time, that one word software, it messes our brains up all the time. As someone who has written a manifesto that builds on the Agile manifesto and explicitly inherits it, extends it, but doesn't attempt to change one word of it, I completely get where you're coming from, Ari. Um, but I think that the question is really timely in that we are trying to apply Agile outside of that software context to combat things that uh, were never contemplated in the uh, original conversation. So I love the idea that that manifesto is closed for modification, but open for extension. There are so many other manifestos already, right? That you can yeah. see around. And, and coming back to the word software, again, for me, outside the world of IT is a no brainer. Because if I do a value delivery, it means that I have to go to full delivery. That's the only way. Um, and, and, and in the, the second half of the 90s, when I did my commercial projects, I always had multiple teams working in parallel and there would be one or two software development teams, but the other ones would do completely different things, but in an agile way. So it's more about the willing, you know what people do because people don't like changes. So when you're talking about something, the first thing they do is, you know, they take a gun and they start shooting at you and saying it's impossible and it's not, it doesn't work like this you know, to the level that you even you know, get called a liar or a cheat or whatever. Um, if you change that into, okay, I have someone here who has a best practice, obviously did it successfully. Let's try and do this as well and not have yes. the continuous debate up front. And I think that's there. And then you have this, this manifesto I think it's, it's still valid and you, you, I think we see, at least I see manifestos around agile testing and about agile analysis and about, I see them all evolving and I read them. But if, if this is what you mean, right? We have the original and from there we build on, great. Yes. But let's, let's look at, at, at in, in, in a collaborative um, uh, setting because what I feel um, very often is that we have those new sort of manifestos put in a silo. And we try to break silos when we work agile and then we yes. bring them into a silo. So there's so many things to say around it, right? But I always say, if you, if you want to change the manifesto, make sure that you get all the benefits and then you feel free to change, right? So there's a long way to go. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome, awesome insight from you all. Oh uh, yeah, um, sorry, Shelby. I thought no, that was- No, it's a, okay. No, I was just going to say, I thought that was a tremendous point at which to probably stop and, and and, and take a break and reflect on what Ari's just said. Um, I thought it was excellent and it was wonderful to see you all kind of um, collaborating and almost kind of debating amongst yourselves. And for us all to witness that, I, I think was, um, was a, a privilege. 
uh, and I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure our attendees did as well. Um, I don't know how I would summarise it before we take a quick break. I was desperately trying to listen and, and communicate with others reaching out to me and um, write some notes. And I guess the short one for me would be that I would probably say it's it's clear we still have work to do. And I think most of you would agree with that. I think it's come up in many of the conversations. There's still a lot to do in terms of management and collaboration. And I think we are constantly finding better ways to do things. And I think when Esther and I spoke, I think that came up in that conversation. And Esther's patron interview, I think ultimately is about learning, continuing to learn on the flow of learning. Um, which I think is something Peter commented on. Um, Agile's history goes much further back than the original authoring of, of, of the manifesto. So there's some other sort of great history there to kind of leverage. Um, and yeah, I, I think a lot of the sessions that make up the program are very much looking at Agile way beyond tech. And I think many of us have been talking about that over the last few years and you, you've, you've touched on it in this session, which is brilliant because I think it gives us plenty to talk about in the second half because I think going beyond technology and looking at it in a broader perspective is where we will be able to see greater gains and also where we will learn new things about the ways we can apply Agile. Um, and I think that's, that, that's, that's, that's what I took away from everything you all said. I probably missed a few things, but that's, that was my, those were my takeaways. What we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to take a quick break, give everybody the chance to to catch their breath and take a comfort break, etc. Uh, and we'll reconvene in, in in maybe about seven minutes or so. I think we've got plenty time. Um, so yeah, if you're all happy to do that, yeah, feel free to stretch your legs and grab a coffee and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we'll see you back at um, yeah about seven minutes past eight minutes past. Fantastic, thank you all. Great session. Love the engagement in the chat. Really good to see.
Here's Celebrate by The Levelers on Amazon Music. Alexa, play Celebrate by Cool and the Gang. Celebration, single version by Cool and the Gang from Scott Spotify. Right, everyone feel better for that? That was tremendous. I just returned and saw all this activity and I thought, wow, I'm definitely at the right party. That was brilliant. <laughs> I'm cutting now. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> right. Oh wow. Okay, we still we still got a lot of folk on. Okay, great. Um, give it another minute, and then we'll uh, we'll resume. And I, I see April. Hi, April. Welcome. Hello. Good to good to see you. Right, and I'm looking for Alistair. There's Alistair. I see Alistair. Hello, yeah. sir. Good to see you. Good right. Here. Did you get to dance, Alistair? I was dancing in my chair. Okay, cool. My, my sister's uh, trying to get in, so we're going to see if we can find uh, a link. I think I just pinged a link into Facebook for you, Alistair. Yeah, I think that's the same one I, I just gave her. And um, she said, I clicked on it once my email password, email address and password. Does, it, does she have to have a Zoom link? Anyway, yeah, I think she it's... Will, she will or she won't. Yeah, I think you have to register. It's um, we we got Zoom bombed. It was quite horrible. There was racial slurs and everything, and um, I think we're a bit of a target. So um, yeah, we've been but, Zoom bombed, and and if they're good, you know, you're not prepared. They just take over everything, and you just go ah, everybody. I'm practiced now. I'm a ninja at kicking people out. Yeah, good deal. <laughs> <laughs> it's exact. It's exactly what we need. No, is that your superpower? Yeah, we don't have that. We don't have that going on. No, I, did, I didn't even know all that. I didn't even know any of that was going on, so you obviously um, dealt with that, Scott. I was, uh, yeah, I was completely oblivious. So it wasn't tonight; it was a previous one. Yeah, but yeah. Oh right, okay, right, okay. Oh wow, well, okay, that's a shame. Right, I think we'll, uh, I think we'll resume, folks. Um, thanks for returning. I hope you're refreshed. You got your coffee and a comfort break and a moment to stretch your legs. We definitely got that with the dancing, so that that that's great. Um, we're joined by uh, Dr. Alistair Coburn. Uh, and April Jefferson. So, welcome to you both. Delighted you could you could join us. Um, in the first half, we did a we did a little very quick sort of intro, but but just like you know, your name and maybe what you know, agile in a word means to you, uh, and maybe probably pertinent for yourself, Alistair. Having reached this twenty year mark, what does that kind of mean to you? I think as an original. Manifesto author, you you might you might have a few words for us there and reflections. So can I start with you just very quickly, and then we're going to go back to the Q and A. We've got a board of questions, and I'm sure there are many for you. Do you want to start with that? Yeah, okay. I just um, first of all, I want to to thank um, Seth for pronouncing my name right for for the <laughs> you who are... uh, but I, I know how to say it. <laughs> uh, so you're Scottish, right? So I have high expectations for you, but not everybody yeah. knows it's pronounced Coburn. With a silent CK. That's a Scottish name, and we've got Scott here and Seth and others to get it right. And we actually have Craig Coburn on here also. So we have a we have a passel of Coburns. And if my sister would get on, we'd have a Vivian Coburn, and then we'd have like I see Esther. Hi Esther. Good to see you. I see all kind of people, names, Lisa, Joanna, all kind of good people. It's a trip, man. I'll tell you that this is 20 years on. It's just a trip. Like I can't even, I can't even fathom it basically, you know, and it's uh, when I show up places, people are, are generally surprised to find out that I'm alive. Like I'll go and go, here's one of the authors of the manifesto and it's like in the history books, you know? So anybody, anybody who graduated from college after, let's say after 2001, it was in the history books, right? So basically anybody who came out of college in the last 20 years and anybody everybody knows that everybody in the history books are dead i mean that's the point of being in history books is you're dead you know and so i go i go leaping up to the front of the room and i'm obviously not dead and they're shocked so that's the first like cognitive dissonance they get with the whole thing and that's kind of weird so yeah 20 um and and we're gonna actually i actually was organizing a, a ski outing at snowbird for next saturday but I got one upped by the the Scrum Alliance. Um, they went and organized a big fat session, and I said, "You better have afternoon skiing set up because 
you know, if you don't have afternoon skiing set up, you're not in the spirit of the manifesto writing because we had afternoon skiing set up. And if you're so businessy, you can't go skiing, then you're not in, then you're not in connection with the manifesto. That's what I have to say. So anyway, I'll be going skiing next Saturday. Love it. Love it. No, fantastic. Rightly so. Rightly so. Thank you for that. April, do you like to just say a few words? Well, so what do you want to know? <laughs> well, you either either give us a agile in a word, or you might want to share a, a short reflection on what what does reaching this twenty twentieth anniversary mark mean to you personally? What does it mean to reach this moment? What stuck out for me uh, the most is agile in a word is mobility, oh. and that uh, is that invokes freedom and uh, power in, in so many ways. Uh, is that I think uh, most of us here understand that uh, Agile is a mindset and uh, within, our, within our mind that uh, that is something that we can control. We control our actions and we control what we think. And, and therefore we have mobility of the mind and and that opens up for possibilities that uh, creates space for experimentation, uh, discovery, connection, so many wonderful things. And that for me, that reflection is that I believe Agile has helped us uncover something more than just uh, our look into software, but our look at humanity. So, fabulous! No, thank you for that. And having joined one of your your open space sessions, I, I definitely felt felt some of that. You know that that sense of community, that inclusivity, and that kind of sense of collective humanity. It was it was really quite wonderful. So, no, thank you, and thank to all of our patrons for their for their contributions over the last 20 years and uh, helping us all get to where we are today. And, and as part of this festival, we, we, we're hoping that everybody who's involved, all the festival goers will use this opportunity to, to pause and reflect and rejoice, celebrate, and also contemplate what might come next and explore that with us uh, and be open-minded to the possibilities. That's something that Scott and I and everybody, all, all the all the amazing volunteers who, who've come together across the globe to to co-create this. I think that's that's something we're all we're all we're hoping will come out. But also we're not going to dictate. It's about emergence. Ellen and I were chatting and Ellen asked me, she said, um, what happens after? I said, I don't really know. We'll have we'll have to see it. It is all about emergence. Let's see what emerges. And uh, hopefully we can do that. We can do that all together. Um, so we, we, we had a, an amazing session just before the break and the questions were coming thick and fast and, 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 and Shelby and Sabrina were doing a tremendous job of getting the questions to, to, our, to our patrons. So we're, we're going we're gonna to continue, we're going to go back to that and continue that for the next 40 minutes or so. And then we're going to, that will give me five minutes at the end just to bring the session to a close. So hopefully you've got Plenty more questions, and we're now also being joined by Alistair and, and April, so I'm sure there are questions for them. So I'm going to hand back over to Shelby and Sabrina and see if they've got some more questions for our, our wonderful patrons. We've got loads of amazing questions. And just to let you guys know, those who can't actually um, get into Miro, if you directly message uh, Shelby while I'm talking, she's going to chuck them into Miro, but make sure you put the person's name you'd like to ask a question to or other, which will be for all patrons. So I've got one for Alistair. Now that you're here, hello. Right. Hi, what a surprise. What a surprise. You actually have a question for me, huh? We've got a couple, actually. We've been holding them off for you. So the first one is, what a process, what a process before you, what, before you created Crystal and implemented Agile, what was the change? I have no uh, idea what that question means. Can you see if you can unpack that? I can have a look. So in here, it's got I about community role situation in early 90s. That's all it says. Have you got the person who wrote it? If you can come off mute, you might be able to ask a 
a put a bit more information. Yeah, in. did that, if that's what it says, I can relate to those words. I you you and you added yes. stuff about process, and I have no idea what. So just read the question one more time. Read the words one more time, exactly as it's there. What a process was before you created Crystal and implemented Agile. What was changed about the community rules and the situation in the early nineties? Oh, I said after five minutes. <laughs> Not that bit. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, right. So I can unpack that um, uh, because they were wondering then what were the processes we were following before we came up with Agile, presumably as a process, right? And, and actually we were fighting against process. So there wasn't a process, there was nil, there was nothing, right? So um, I started in 91, I was hired by IBM to create a, a process and methodology, a documented one for the IBM consulting group and IBM services to use for small talk and C++ projects. In 91, they had a methodology um, for, for non-object oriented languages, you know, with the databases and the in, in whatever the standard kit was at the time. And it was already at that time, um, um, very mature and very subtle. It was a plug in, start where you are, uh, a small improvements thing, but they had a hole, a gap right around the small talk and C++. And um, I didn't know anything about methodologies. So my boss said, well, why don't you go and just debrief some teams and find out what works? If we don't have any vested interest, whatever's good, you know, we'll just use it. Uh, and so I started doing um, years of flying around the world, interviewing and debriefing project teams around the world. And the, and the stunning thing was there was no process, right? There, there was nothing you could write down. And, and using the books available at the time, it was a big mystery because it was like, if I would say, what did you, did you do this? No, did you use case tools? No, did you do this? No, did you have, you know, whatever? No, 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 no. And, and the punchline was what I ended up writing is crystal clear, which is you take sort of three to nine people, you put them in a room and you give them access to the customers and you deliver software in those days, two months was a short cycle, but you know, you show that you, you get question and answer with the users you show the customers what you're doing, you know, and you periodically you pause and regroup. And that's what they were doing. And, and there was no way to describe it because there's no process there. So there was no process. These people were just doing things that wasn't written down in any book. And so that was what I was wrestling with was how do you write something that, that basically has no description other than put a couple of people in a room and let them talk to each other and talk to the customers. So that was, so Crystal Clear, which I wrote in 98, was literally just me documenting what they said worked. And I've checked it multiple times since then. I go to a small successful project team and I say, what's like really important to you? They said, give us three to six people, put us in a room, keep distractions away, give us access to the customer, let us deliver you know, periodically and we'll take care of everything else. But, and that's it. And so that was a mis it was mysterious how to describe that in any way that could be replicable, but it turns out exactly that description is all you need. So that's the question. What was the process before there was an agile process? It was a void is what there was. The next one we got is for April. So I've actually got two questions for you, April. So I'm going to start off with the first one here. They're quite interesting ones as well. What is the most uh, most difficult in the path of becoming an Agilist? And in the second one, you might be able to link up with this is three tips on how a true Agilist su um, survives in lockdown. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so, I think uh, practice is uh, how you become an Agilist. Um, that it is it's a more of a, a mental practice with intention. Um, that was definitely my journey, uh, focusing on, on something. We have that wonderful uh, manifesto that we all talk about so often, whether um, I think wherever you begin, if you focus on a particular area, it all kind of circles back to everything else. So that's how you become. Is a practice focus in, make it a, uh, and figure out how, how can I uh, continue uh, to explore it? What else? 
and that's a part of the journey that is it's not over because there's a, a constant uh, uh, exploration of those things. So pick one, start someplace, and that's your journey. What would your three tips be to survive lockdown? Is take time for breath. Is that it's easy to get bogged down in the online world. Uh, but move away from it all. Dance, which we all, I came in and we were dancing and I just joined in. Um, figure out what your dance is. Maybe your dance is a walk. Um, so I implore people to take breath, uh, invite stillness in, dance, journal, do something offline and cut, under, understand who you are. So it's a great time to get in touch with yourself. Um, That's some really good advice. Um, out of interest, I know this question was just for April. Does any of the other patrons, do you have any advice on how to survive lockdown being an Agilist? <laughs> question is, is specifically for an Agilist. I think it's more an Agile people that are caught in this situation, right? Uh, what helps, I think, if you're an Agilist, you're open to change. And what a lot of people do is they try to improve the situation they're in instead of changing the situation uh, to another situation. Um, uh, and so don't do the little bits of improvement, but really make a, make a change. Um, and I've been experimenting, you know, for the last couple of months in my house as well. Also, I spend a lot of time in South Africa trying to redefine my workspace and one of the things that I got, I really uh, forced myself to do, which was new from what I, when I'm here, I just bought some gym, gym materials and I, I go to my own gym in the garage these days. And I forced myself, which I never did in the past because you know, your physical shape is different when you, when you are sitting in and around the house all the time in the Netherlands, it's not even that bad. But um, So instead of improving where you are, change the situation. And experiment and keep on doing that. I think that's what we do, right? That's really good advice. Uh, like, and we'll go on. I like the idea that um, a lot of the benefit we've had from Agile is people working in little rooms together. Well, we have little rooms, but to get them to work properly in an Agile context, we need high cadence interactions. So rather than thinking about, well, I need to have a meeting with someone as a transaction, think about it as a relationship and keep up the cadence. So for example, uh, Alistair talked about skiing. Well, last week I had a business meeting from a surf ski in the middle of Byron Bay. You can do that these days, but do it. Doesn't matter if you're paddling a surf ski or if you're out in the slopes, make certain that you keep regular contact with the people that you're working with. Yeah, we do it. I want to jump in and add one more thing here to the mix of really good advice that people have been giving. Um, and someone just said in the chat, dealing with uncertainty. I think that the pandemic is helping us see our habitual ways of clinging to our belief in certainty and permanence. And it's just really clear that things are uncertain and nothing is permanent um, yet. As human beings, we don't really love that so much. So for me, I've really been paying attention to what are the anchor points that I cling to and what, what about clinging to them is keeping me from moving to the next level that I could potentially move to. And, you know, in a nutshell, this is really what's going on with Agile's influence in the world is that Agile is helping us see the places where we cling. I work most often now with um, leaders and leadership teams who are in most cases in a bit of pain because they know the ways they have been working aren't a match for our new world. We talk about VUCA all the time, but I love this new thing that I just learned about that Harvard Business Review published in December called 3D change, that it's pervasive, 
it's perpetual and it's exponential and humans are not actually geared for any of those very well. <laughs> so we're up for a, a really, we're up for a leap. I think that's what's going on. We're up for a leap as uh, humanity. And um, I think it's really cool and horrible that we get the chance to look at the places that we want to cling to certainty. Boy, I can feel it in myself. So um, if I could, if I could uh, uh, pop in here. Uh, um, Agile, as, as we wrote it, is pretty much geared to extroverts. Uh, there's all this communication. So introverted developer types, you know, really have this problem that they're suddenly being told they have to communicate and talk and all the rest of it. So we take the question, what is it that keeps you, you know, sane or, or, or safe during the COVID time? We tend to see uh, the advice about, about go out and make connections. But when I, I look at the posts by some of the introverted people, they're, they're home, they're grooving, they're happy. They finally have got the life they want. So if we look at neurodiversity as a topic, right? We have to watch out that we, it's, I'm extroverted. So I naturally, you know, gravitate to, towards suggestions like, like what I was going to say, you know, to what, what, what um, Peter and Ari, Ari said, those were all work-related connections. And so I was about to say, you know, go for the non-work related connections. Do the, we have, we set up literally for the heart of Agile, we set up a coffee corner every Wednesday at noon, um, USA East Coast time, hour to an hour and a half of just chat, literally just chat, right? About anything. So you reach out, but that's, then it occurred to me, that's all extroverted recommendation, right? What do the introverts do? I'm not an introvert, I can't say, but, but they have their own, right? So, so you find your touch points, what, what, what brings you warmth around that. And the other thing is um, uh, the, the, the introspection. All the people, when I, I ask periodically, so what good, what have you gained from 2020? Every positive answer was, I had time to introspect. I looked at my values. I developed myself. All of the positive things are around the introspection. And I, I guess the people who are unhappy, I, I can't say they didn't introspect water, but that's the, the general pattern I get from the positive answers. So those are the two things I wanted to pop in. I hope it's okay to jump in. Um, with one final comment. I know this one's just been really- Sorry. Um, yes, it's a good. really important topic. Um, I think we have to be intentional about being positive um, because there's a lot of stuff that's bringing us down mentally and emotionally right now. And um, just to be vulnerable, and I'm sure all of you guys have been through this, but this year was my last year was the first year that I had to lay off people from my company. And I doubted myself as a leader, like it made me really pause, like, do I really know what I'm doing? Because you have to pivot, as Gabriella said, you have to pause and pivot and change your direction. And it makes you doubt yourself, it makes you question. And being like being intentional about being positive because there's so much negativity hitting us every day. And I'm just showing you one of the things that I look at every day in front of me, which is the, she believed she could, so she did. Um, this, and I wear it also as a bracelet, but I have to anchor myself around being around positive people and thinking positive thoughts. And every time something negative comes across, translating it into what am I gonna get out of this? What am I gonna learn from it? I just wanted to end with that because I think it's very important to be intentional about being positive. Thank uh, thanks, Sally, that was brilliant. I always love it when you kind of just start to have a kind of like a mini conversation amongst yourselves and you just build on the conversation. I think it, it, I think it's wonderful for everybody to witness and, uh, and hear it and take their own insights from it. So no, th thank you for that. Um, can we take a few more questions, uh, Shelby? What else have we got? What else, what else have we got on the board? Oh, we got we 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 just got, before that, Seth, uh, have we got have we got a hashtag or something that we could maybe communicate on Twitter to each other about? Um, I just I, I didn't know what it was. Yes, yeah, sorry, Scott. I have um, been trying to ask questions, and I'm also the lovely lady behind the tweet tweets at the moment. So all your lovely shout outs tonight have come directly from me, and I'm trying to catch up with everybody. But um, if you'd like to use everybody, my agile twenty G mm. twenty reflect that would be absolutely amazing. Um, may, obviously, make sure that you tag us um, at agile twenty reflect org. That would be absolutely great. Um, and it's just popped into uh, hashtag is just popped. I was going to say, well, if you stick it in the chat, we also showed it. Uh, showed it on a slide at the start, but yeah, good, 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 good shout, Scott. Good shout. Thanks, Scott. 
and thank you to everybody. That would be great if you could just uh, tweet. And, and and I hope I tweeted well for you to, to this evening. Um, one question, question to Roman. So there's a question on the board that says, we are currently focusing on bringing together product and engineering at a programme level and are meeting um, great resistance from the product team. There's a great lack of trust. How would you re recommend us building that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm happy to take that. I mean, fire all the product managers and bring in agile product owners. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I, couldn't resist. I mean, I think it's a, it's a it's a it's a lovely question. Thank you for asking it because it, it sort of uh, touches upon again what was mentioned a few times in in the conversation over the past one and a half hours or good hour. So and that is, um, I don't think we're gonna be able to benefit from an increased agility in agile practices if we don't treat each other as human beings. And so if there's a trust issue, well, you know, we have to build trust. How do we build trust? Well, a key way to build trust is to empathize, empathize with the, the product group, the product managers, the product people, and try and understand why they may be hesitant, of why they why they see some barriers, um, and uh, understand their situation, understand, in a way, their needs, their goals, um, and be honest, act with integrity. That's another great way to build trust in you know, by doing so, by developing empathy and being honest, communicating intention and plans, getting to know them. And again, that'd be another trust building factor. Um, so I think it's really a, a relationship building exercise, ultimately, um, rather than, you know, something that I've done in the past, going and and lecture. <laughs> I mean, That's... that can be tempting, right? I mean, particularly if you feel, you know, oh my God, they're not getting it. And why are they so hesitant? Why do they resist a change that is going to be positive for all of us? And it can be then easy to, to feel sort of a little bit righteous and, um, you know, want, want to, to teach people. But I think it's, it's better probably first to, to try and listen, actively listen and understand and empathize and then try and find a, a way forward together. Yeah. Hey, one more thing. Um, there is a mathematics to trust that John Nash worked out. There's a website called The Evolution of Trust, which I, it has a beautiful simulation about mathematics. Go and have a look at that. The biggest factor that you can change as an agilist is to do with reward models that actually motivate trust. But go look at that site. You'll figure it out. What's that site again? The Evolution of Trust. It's by a fellow named Nick Case. Beautiful animations and really interesting and deep outcome very simple now we'll try to get that out as well on the, on the thank you gabrielle i want to just add to build on what roman said is that um i think we have to be empathetic to where people are and meet them where they are because nobody really likes having an outsider come in and tell them you've been doing it all wrong or tell them how to do their work you know that breaks trust because when people start, they have no idea if this newcomer understands them or can help them in any way, just as the, the outsider or newcomer has no idea what the capabilities and struggles and values of the team are, right? So, so I think sometimes, you know, rather than, than you know, coming in with the agile, we should come in with trying to understand and then trying to do the smallest thing we can that actually helps the team from where they are. And that will build some trust and that will start some rapport. And then you can maybe steer things in, a, in a, another direction. That is some really great, that, that, that just awesome. I completely agree with you. And that, I suppose, leads really nicely to the next question. And it's directed for, for Peter. It says, is Agile a mindset for everyone? Or are there people that were just born to do it? Oh, goodness. I, I don't think anyone was born to do anything. We're all learning. Um, I, I guess I would suggest we often talk about the, the eternal beginner, that we, we, we don't want to think in terms of Shu Hari, but Mu Hin Shu, which is to say the evolution of a learning ecosystem where we work together as peers to learn and learning flows through that ecosystem. By ecosystem, I mean a network of mutual benefit. And I see what we are doing here today as a beautiful exemplar of that kind of mutual benefit. So just in this conversation, the way we've been pinging around, if you're not born to do that, we're all born to do that. 
I, 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 yes, we are born, born. I, I totally believe that myself. Excellent question. And that, that then, um, I've got two questions now that are going to, um, one's going to go to, um, the beautiful Ellen. So it says, if you had one wish for agile, um, what would it be? But there's, there's, there's a, a slight add on to that because I think that's been asked generically for everybody, but I'd like to come to Ellen for that if possible, please. First. So ironically, I think my one wish for agile is that we stop talking so much about agile because that creates the idea that it's a monolithic one way of doing things, right? It's, it's a very, very useful label to describe a lot of things, but I find it gets, you know, like when Ari said earlier, as soon as we put that word software in, we start to, you know, messes our minds up. A lot of the times when we start talking about agile, it messes our minds up. And if we can just kind of set it aside and start to focus on what are the problems we're trying to solve? How can we better notice what are the things that we're doing that are working and how can we amplify them without getting caught up about whether it's agile or not agile or what kind of agile it is. That's really my wish for as we take this conversation forward. Let's focus on, you know, it goes back to that very first line of the manifesto. We are uncovering better ways of doing things together. Paying attention to what are we uncovering and worrying a little less about what we label them. Any 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 of other our other patrons have a have a thought? Yeah, I did, but uh, be, because the conversation kind of, um, evolved a bit, can you give me the original question again? So the original question was. Uh, bear with me, Dr. Alastair Cooper. Mess, bear with me. If you had one wish for Agile in 2020, oh, this says 2022, what would it be? Mm. Yeah, obviously drop the software. Um, what I do in an organization, if I go there and, 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 and literally it was a big company and they go, really smart, really senior people will say, how do we get this company to be more Agile? And I said, um, I think you're asking the question wrong. Uh, allegedly, Agile gets you something. If you just try to focus on, on what making the company what you think the word Agile is, you're aiming at a, at, a, at a wrong target. So you'll get to whatever you think that is, and that won't be the thing that gets you the thing that you think you want. So how about you say, if we had Agile, we were that, what would we get? And then aim stream for, straight for that. And then the agile library of tricks, which is in fact all it is, right? So, so just to, to regroup on the manifesto, the key word in the manifesto is the word uncovering. All the stuff predated, by definition, all of it predated. Crystal clear was, came out of my interviews from people in 1991, two, three, four, five, right? So that stuff was there in 91, two, three, four, five. Gabrielle Benefield was doing this stuff in the nineties. They didn't have a name. People like me interviewed people like her wrote down what they were doing. So it's a bag of tricks and the, and the values of the manifesto are like, there are no doubt 200 really important things. We cherry picked four, right? And, and it's an awesome, awesome team experience. I, I, I often ask people to do, get your team, your company together and just say, everybody, you get to pick three to five things. You have to live with them forever. That's all you get. What are you gonna pick and live from them? Three to five, we happen to choose four, right? Um, and you could get different things, but it's like you've cherry picked and said, if I have to like hang my hat on these things and live with them forever and I don't get anything else, I'll hang my hat on these. And we chose those four. So, and then, and then behind that are all this bag of tricks that we use. So if you go, we want to get there and there's this bag of tricks. What out of this bag of tricks is useful? And oh, by the way, there could be other tricks that could be useful and get, but let's focus on the there and not this funny target that we label Right, so that's would be my wish, and and I see people nodding. So like anybody who's been in, been around for for a bunch is like tired of aiming at the. You give it a tag word, but then people focus on the tag word and they, and, and they miss the picture of what they're trying to get at. Yeah, I see Ellen. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my next question is actually for, is actually for Gabrielle. So it says Gabrielle. At Snowbird in 2001, what if 50% were women? How different would the manifesto be? No, I saw that one. That just made me laugh. And I thought, <laughs> well, it would have been a lot cooler. It would have been laid out a bit better, you know. But it's always amazed me. I, I keep wanting, actually, it's something for you, Alistair. I always wanted to know, how come there were no women there? I'm sure you've been asked this, but 
I'm like, damn, I should have just had my skis around that day and popped in. Because, All right, so, so you know, why? I just was asked that question yesterday and I'm tired of being an apologist. I just want to go around. <laughs> Name all the women who are published methodologists in the in the pre-agile light process world in 1999. Well, what about Mary Poppendick? Wouldn't she have been she wasn't published? Around was she, time. published? She, she wasn't known. Her book came out in 2003. Did it? Okay. And right. why is Maybe that? I can why, jump why, on this. Yeah, do why it. Why are we so here. late to the game? Go ahead, sorry, Ari. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can jump on this because I don't know who made the list of NVTs when we, when we wrote the manifesto, right? I just don't know. That's Bob. But Martin I know that uh, <laughs> at least the story the says uh, that uh, there were a couple of people more invited, um, and some people said no because they didn't want to uh, spend uh, you know the weekend with a couple of guys in a in a sweaty room. Um, but I also know that uh, leading uh, one of the leading uh, ladies in the DSDM world, when I represented the DSDM and we wrote the manifesto, was asked before me. And the, the, I, I, I don't remember. even know what that the motivation was, was not to go, but what? she decided herself not to go. So that doesn't mean... Yeah, what's her, what's that her name, was, Ari? She's, she's the only person that I knew in the DSDM community. Jennifer Stapleton. Yeah, that's right. Wonderful person. Yeah. And and I don't say that if we if we have had would have this one lady in the group that all of a sudden it would have diversity. No, no. It was a very white male group in that room. It's what it is. We can't change that anymore. Sorry. Yeah. But getting back to the original question, what would have been different? I think that's actually an interesting question. And I don't know. I mean, with all these sort of this idea that whenever we segment things into male, female, whatever it is, you know, we're categorizing and God knows what would have been different because maybe it would have been exactly the same. You know, at the end of the day, we're giving voice to something that's out there. So sometimes I think we, by, by continuing to segment, we segment further. Um, what would have been different? I don't know. If I'd been there, I don't know. What would have been different? Um, yeah, you know, we could have toppled the whole thing. Who knows? It's like sliding doors. We might not have had a manifesto, right? We might have had a, I don't know, something different. So, so that's a, I, I don't know. Can I pop in here? There's, there's two things. Yeah. One's the invitation list and one's how the manifesto looks different. So um, Bob Martin had the invitation list. So I was organizing a, a workshop in Snowbird at that same time, February in Snowbird. Um, I, and I was modeling it after things we did in the 90s called Workshop on Object Oriented Design Wood. So the way it looked, the way it was structured was exactly to copy and extend the wood workshops that we had held in 94, 95, 96, 98. And I figured it was time to do it again. And as I was starting to organize that, Bob Martin uh, wrote an email and said, I want to do this, this thing with the manifesto and stuff, February in, in Chicago. And, and I looked at his invitation list and he had, you know, he had Tom DeMarco in there and he had, he had Grady Booch in there and, you know, his invitation list was better than my invitation list and his topic was better than my topic. So I just decided to throw in with him, right? I said, so, but I'll organize it. And then we had a choice between Chicago in February and Snowbird in February. And, and between you and me, you know, and the brick wall and the 10,000 people who are gonna look at the video, Jim Highsmith was living in Salt Lake at the time. We had both been traveling too much. Neither of us wanted to get on a plane and go to Chicago in February. So we basically hijacked and said, well, we'll organize it if you hold it at Snowbird, right? And if you don't hold it in Snowbird, we're not getting on a plane anyway. So we like, like sat on, on, the, on the location. And then I organized it and I modeled it after the wood, which is why there was afternoon skiing and all the rest of that. But, but it was his invitation list and I didn't look at it. I didn't pay attention. And it hurts me a lot because Rebecca Weersprock should have been there because Rebecca Weersprock was at every wood workshop 94, 96, 97, the one I organized in Norway in 98, she was there. Like she was in the conversation the entire time. And had I been organizing, she's on the top of my list. I didn't notice that she wasn't there. The only other person I know of was Adele Goldberg, but she just wasn't in the circuit. Like she wrote the book and then got out, right? And passed the court torch to Kenny Rubin. And, and, and um, somebody just mentioned, Esther mentioned Martine um, DeVos, who's, who's excellent. Um, and she was semi in the circuit, but wasn't well enough known to be like on the list of the lists, right? You'd have to dig a bit to find her. Those are the only three women that I know. The other thing I, I want to get to is how would the manifesto look different? So what was very unusual, so people like harassed that they were white males in the room and, and, and rightly so, if you look at the pictures of all of us, it's a, it's a very white middle-aged male group. Um, 
but I will say that the thing that you think about when women are going to be present, that, right, that, that characteristic that you imagine that women bring to a pile of men talking is women listen better. That's really, you know, to me, that's the kind of the stereotypic thing. That's what you inject women into, into a session because you want the men to stop talking and the women, you, you know, <laughs> listen to each other, right? And soften, soften the conversation. That was the most best listening meeting I've ever been to in my life. There was the most generous listening in there where nobody dissed anybody else at any time. Anybody had a point of view was honored in a very full way. So in that sense, as we said at the end, if you'd swapped anybody out for anybody, like if Tom DeMarco had been there, if Grady Booch had, it would have been a different story top to bottom. Everything would have been different. So if you put a woman in, everything would have been different. It wouldn't have been more different because it was a woman. It would have been just been a different conversation. But the, Can but I the add on this, uh, Alistair? But the magic of the meeting was the quality of the listening that was, yeah, what, who? Can I can I add a little bit on this, uh, Alison? Hey, you were there. Um, in the room, can Ari. we hear? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ari, 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 could we hear from some of the women? Um, I, was, yeah. I was just going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm hoping to bring this particular debate to close. It's been fabulous, and it's great to hear all your opinions. But uh, I, I, to be honest, I'm sure this one's going to come up again and again over the course of the month in various except, other events. Except, except Seth, you have the unusual situation of two people who are in the room. So it yep. would be, be a sin not to hear what Ari has to say. Absolutely. And then, and then we'll, I think we'll move on if that's, that's okay. Ari, please. Well, I, I, I tend to make a joke right when you're in front of a group and I ask, like, what happens if you, if you put 17 guys in a room? And then very often from the audience, uh, ladies will shout back, nothing. Right, so that's that's the first one. But I always say then the follow-up line is, most of the time when you put guys together in a room, 17 guys, everyone will try to explain to the other 16 that his idea is best. And I agree with Alistair that this was about listening and giving space to each other. And that's unusual. Um, so I think, I don't know what would have been different. I have no clue. It's, it okay. has even no value to speculate, but I do know that the listening uh, was on a high level at that time. It was really good. Can, can I tell a funny story though? I was having breakfast with Martin Fowler and Jeff Sutherland one day and Jeff is this optimist and we were talking about the manifesto and he went, oh yeah, it was fantastic. You know, these 17 people came together, we discussed it for days and out of it emerged this wonderful, beautiful manifesto. And Martin, who's really, um, you know, he's very English and sort of slightly direct, but great. He just looked at Jeff and went, that's not how I remember it. He said, I remember us arguing and debating for three days. And by the end, we we're so exhausted. The only thing we could agree on was the Agile Manifesto. So <laughs> that was oh. interesting. That's it. Thanks for that, Gabrielle. No, it's good, good, good to hear all those perspectives. We have about nine minutes left. I need about four minutes or so just to wrap up. So maybe if we got, maybe we've got a couple of questions, maybe. Shelby, Sabrina, maybe. Can I Shelby, you're, on, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, everybody. I I do Sorry. have one quick question for Lisa. It says, "What is a true a true role of a senior leader C-suite um, executive within an agile organization? How can senior leaders ha leaders help to make make everyone feel like they have a place within that agile space?" There's a lot to say about this. Um, the thing that I'll pick up on is that senior leaders themselves have their own agile transformation, if you will, to go through, but it's different than what team members go through. Um, the big shift that senior leaders, I think we are all going through in general, but it's really endemic in senior leadership because of how they've been rewarded, is this, is this shift from solving problems and being reactive to problems to understanding that their job is to create environments. That's a really huge, huge shift. I mean, I have such compassion for how big a shift that is. And so that's like a, a meta shift that goes on with C-suite executives who really want to leverage Agile for the business results they're trying to get, right? Not for its own sake. Um, and 
how that looks, how that moves down into the organization, into all the different ways that they will then behave is very specific to what the organization's up to and what the executives are doing. But I think that if an organization is serious about leveraging Agile and, and having its full promise come forward, then no one's gonna follow an executive who hasn't been in a change process themselves. And I think this is what executives are starting to understand, at least the ones that I'm working with these days. And it is, it's not a short road for sure. And then I, I think I've, and this is um, um, addressed to all, all the famous ladies that are on this call. Um, as women, we know that we are um, sometimes hindered in this great world of men that work in our industry and realm. How do we combat that as women? How do we come together to have that voice just to support us and say that we are just as strong as the men that we work with? We do it by not being like them. So what I am advocating these days is for us to educate ourselves on both the feminine and masculine energies, both the yin and the yang energies, and for us to all be more integrated human beings. And so for some women, that means picking up more assertiveness or more directionality. For some women, it means picking up more nurturing and harmonizing and being able to move into the shadow and the depth and that is the incredible value of the yin energy that we have been missing so much for these last 150 years in business. So my heart is racing right now because I really wanna advocate for integration, not for one over the other. If we simply replace female chauvinism with male chauvinism, we've not gotten anywhere new. What I would add to it is, um is be okay with showing up as your full self. One thing uh, last year has definitely taught me, especially as we looked at people uh, of color, um, the, the black community in the space is that we have been silent quite often in, uh, um, in not, not speaking up um, when, when we've been harmed uh, or in different ways by being more communicative and, uh, and sharing and understanding that, yes, it could have some negative results to it, but uh, be okay with uh, be okay with that, uh, to walk in your full self and that we may be surprised. Esther? I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead, <laughs> and, and I was gonna say the same, just quickly to, to you, Esther, and to you, Sally. Yeah, I was just going to share that um, being a Black woman uh, from Sudan, being a Muslim, living in a country during September 11th and, and you know how Muslims were being perceived, there was a lot of reasons for me to feel like I was being rejected. There was a lot of reasons for me to not speak up, but I didn't. I always spoke up. I always, like April said, was myself. I never looked at that. Um, I never looked for it. Um, I think that's important is I didn't look for it. So even when it did hit me sometimes, I ignored it. And I just moved forward in a very confident way because I believe in myself and I believe in God and I believe in the path forward. Um, so just having that, it's not arrogance, but confidence, lo loving yourself, nurturing yourself, showing up as who you are. I was in a session with a lot of executives and I had to be honest and truthful about being a Muslim. And that was my moment of coming out because I had never spoken openly and honestly about my faith uh, because it was being attacked in that moment. Um, and I had to speak up and that took so much courage for me, but that was the day that I grew up as a, as a leader, not just as a woman, but just as a leader being myself. So just, you know, don't look for it, um, be who you are and, and be confident and comfortable in your own skin. Fantastic. Who, Ellen, you, did you want to just add to that quickly for our wrap up? I, just a couple of words to wrap up what people said. Show up, claim your space, and help others to do so. That's how we all move forward. Fantastic. Can I add one quick thing? Because I've been actually dwelling a little bit on the why didn't um, women, why weren't they published, right? The systemic cause for the manifesto. And something I noticed, so I've got a teenage daughter, she's incredibly smart, like she's just brilliant, but there's a self-deprecation that goes on. 
And so I think for women, I, the advice I say is be okay being better and being as good and, and recognize that because I think it holds us all back. I think it's really ingrained that, and there's so much research showing that women are often two or three times better and yet they are subordinate to other people who aren't. So be okay being better and being as good as you are. It's okay to be like that. Fantastic. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I, I would Sorry. just echo the, the, the thought that you, Sorry, don't have to, you don't have to imitate men to be successful, right? Um, yeah. A lot of companies, you know, say they want to bring in more gender balance and then they hire a bunch of women and expect them to act just like the men. And they are criticized for, you know, hand, they don't, you know, they don't get in there and duke it out in meetings. Well, that's because they've been working behind the scenes to build consensus, you know? So, so I think, you know, I think, um, I think, you know, don't, don't, don't try to imitate, but also try to explain that um, there are many ways to get things done. You know, we have in, in the business culture been predominantly exposed to one way of getting things done. Women very often, not this is a generalization, very often bring a different energy and a different way of accomplishing things because of the way we're socialized. Um, so, so help people appreciate that. Yeah, so many powerful messages there. That, that is incredible. We, we're right up to time. I always mm -hmm. like to, to finish on time as those who, who, who used to be hosting sessions such as these. We could go on all night. Lovely if we could. Unfortunately, we can't. Um, There's an opportunity an absolute, for all women on the no call. There's an opportunity for all women on the call to be in the room for the Descaling Manifesto in one hour's time. So as an invitation to all of you and other people, please do come along and contribute. There we go. Quick plug from Peter there. So <laughs> absolutely. And we've, and we've, we've opened the cafe. The cafe is open. So if anyone would like to talk about anything we talked about, the Discord link's there in the chat and anyone can come in the chat. That's a great idea, Scott. Thank you. But no, it has been a tremendous session. I've thoroughly enjoyed hosting it. It's been so thought thought provoking, so many powerful messages, such inspiration so early on in the festival. So 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 thank you all. I think it only fair if whoever's still on the call, I can't I can't see the numbers. If you briefly unmuted and thanked our patrons, our wonderful patrons for giving up two hours of their time and joining us and being so amazing and answering so many questions, <laughs> sharing their thoughts. It has been fantastic. Thank you all. We are we are really grateful. We are very grateful. And um, yeah, there are so many other opportunities, folks, to hear from our patrons. They're all doing different things over the course of the month. Uh, Lisa is joining me for a panel discussion on Wednesday. Uh, there are so many other things. Alice is doing things. Roman's got sessions. Peter's just mentioned one of his. Gabrielle's got sessions. Sally's doing one with me later in the, in the month. There's so much stuff going on. So do please, do please check it out in the calendar. And thanks for your participation. I couldn't keep up with the chat. It was on fire. There was so much stuff getting shared. It was absolutely brilliant. And I have to give a shout out to my, my fellow co-hosts, Shelby and Sabrina, who are just awesome. And they did a great job of helping me. I could not have done this on my own. There was just no way. So they definitely deserve a round of applause. And uh, listen, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, do enjoy the rest of the festival. Learn. Let's all be open-minded, make connections and, you know, find a path forward, however, whatever that looks like for you. But uh, thank you again. Very grateful. And uh, Everyone. Enjoy, the rest of, enjoy the rest of the festival, folks. Thank you, thank Seth. You. you did a thank wonderful you. job. You did a great thank job. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, guys. <laughs>